I love my city. Anybody who knows me knows that I cannot have enough great things to say about the city of Chicago. I love being from Chicago. I love living in Chicago. I love it when people visit me and, and hang out in my city. And I love my city so much that I actually have all of these brochures that I keep around in case people come and visit me. And they come, you know, because when you've been in ministry for a minute, uh, when you've been in ministry for a minute, you start to meet people from all over the country and all over the world, and they come and they stay with you. And so I have maps that I was biking in Chicago and uh, architecture in Chicago, and uh, you are here that shows you kind of every neighborhood and everything you'd want to see in the city of Chicago. I even have brochures just for my neighborhood about Paseo Boricua, which tells you about the Puerto Rican history of our city and what you might find in my neighborhood. I love, love love my city. Um, I tell my husband sometimes we should name our, our it's kind of like a, a hostel, a hostel uh, in the hood. You know, it's kind of like a ministry retreat center for hippies and hipsters. That's how I see it. And so people come and they stay with us, and we have a name for it. It's called Casa Azul, which just means blue house. There's nothing fantastic or spiritual. It's a blue house, so we named it Casa Azul, and that's what people call it. And when people come, I want to take them places. I always say, you know, when I retire from ministry, I'm going to become a professional tour guide. And what is great about a good tour guide, about a great tour guide, is that great tour guides take you to places that you want to go. You like shopping, they take you. You like sports, they take you. You want museums, they take you there. But a great tour guide also takes you to places that you need to go. They introduce you to foods that you didn't know existed in Chicago. Like a jibarito, which is a steak sandwich with plantains on the outside, steak, onions, garlic on the inside. If you have been at Trinity for more than a year and you have never had one, I am so sorry. Please come to Humble Park. Stay at my house and I will take you for a jibarito. A great tour guide takes you to things that you go beyond Chicago pizza and beyond Chicago hot dogs, but to places where you need to go that you didn't know existed. And such, I think, is a good worship leader. Such, I think, is a good worship pastor who takes you not only to places where you want to go, but to places where you need to go. Not just to experiences you want to have, but to experiences that you need to have. Recently, as I was collaborating with John Whitliffe at the Calvin Institute of Worship uh, for the symposium that recently uh, uh, was in January, he gave me some words for that. He said, Sandra, that's called expressive worship and formative worship, expressive worship, spaces that you create in your congregation for people to come and talk to God just as they are and say anything they want to say to him, and spaces of worship where you form people, you lead them somewhere, you take them somewhere, you show them something about God they did not know. Expressive worship and formative worship. And in expressive worship, the problem is on any given Sunday or any given chapel, time that we have together, we're all coming in wanting to say a lot of different things. Some of us want to say, God, I love you. Some of us want to say, I'm sorry. Some of us want to say, where are you and why? Why, God? And so great worship and good worship will allow spaces where people can come as they are and say thank you and say why and say how long and say I'm sorry. But great spaces of worship will also give you an opportunity to form in areas that you are not good at, like saying, I'm sorry, God. <laughs> Maybe we always want to say, I love you, or thank you, and we never want to say, I'm sorry. Or we don't feel we have the freedom to say, why? Why, God? And so we have spaces of expressive worship and spaces of formative worship, where we are stretched and formative worship allows us to align our mind, our heart, and our strength with Christ so that we can grow in his likeness. So this morning I want to propose that worship in community by the Spirit forms us in Christ so that we may grow into his likeness. Worship in community by the Spirit forms us in Christ so we may grow into his likeness. Anchored in 2 Corinthians verse 3 and 18, which was read earlier, as well as in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me reread 2 Corinthians, verse 3, 18. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, 
are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I want to point out a few things that I found instructive and encouraging in this one passage. First of all, we see that the community is the context of our formation and transformation. Verse 18 starts with, we all. In a paper eloquently written by Dr. Roy for ETS 2007 on the topic of worship and spiritual formation, Dr. Roy argues that the passage has a community focus for transformation, that we are intended to pursue formation in community. It's about being formed alongside one another, together, as we do life together, as we encounter things together, as we study who God is and encounter him together, alongside one another. The verse starts with we all. As Christians, we all are in the process of being formed. It's a call for everyone and in community. It's a call for everyone, not just those that we lead, but for us as well. Not just those that we lead, but for us as well. So let me stop here. When I came to Trinity, I already had a decade of ministry experience. I, I thought I knew a lot. I thought I knew a lot about who God was. I thought I knew a lot about myself. I thought I knew a lot about doing ministry. I was wrong. I was wrong. And while I was here, I didn't just learn. I changed. I didn't just learn, I changed. God formed me in the presence of his people and in his word and in worship here in this space, in the classroom, in the coffee conversations, in chapel, in the library when I was crying about that paper. God changed me. And I'm happy to say that I'm not the same person I was when I left in 2011. God is continually forming us and shaping us and changing us through worship as we encounter him in community. Isn't that great news? Isn't that great news to you and I that, that we're not done? That God has something more for us here than a degree a piece of paper, knowledge, but an actual invitation to be formed by him, by his spirit, in community, into his likeness. That's good news to me. <laughs> That's very good news. It's unique to us, I think. So we're constantly in scripture, right? We're constantly in scripture for someone. We're constantly in scripture for something for a paper, for a sermon, for a word, for someone else, right? We're kind of like, the image I have is like a Latino mom serving dinner. If you've never had the opportunity, it's great. It's a fantastic sport to watch. <laughs> she serves everybody first. Everybody's plates are full. Everybody has what they need. She's already gone to the kitchen six or seven times. She's sweating. She may have had a bite or two while she was cooking, but the meal experience around the table, she totally missed it because she was so busy taking care of everybody else. And the good news to us is that God wants to change us. God wants to form us. We're not just in worship and in scripture so that we can have it for someone or for something, but God wants to do it in us too. And for some of us, we need to hear that we're not done yet and not miss out. Next, in the text we hear, we are being transformed into his image, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Next, we're reminded that the Spirit of God is the agent of transformation. The Spirit of God is the agent of transformation. So turn to the person next to you and say, you are not the Spirit. And tell the other person, you are not the Spirit either. Who does that transformation come from? The Lord, not us. It is the Spirit who enables and empowers people to turn to the Lord in faith. 
thereby taking away the veil from their eyes and their hearts. It is the Spirit who initiates the lifting of the veil. It is the Spirit of God who gives revelation. It is the Spirit of God who gives transformation. It is the Spirit of God who gives spiritual formation. He is the one who does the work. Not us. Because we are not the Spirit. Through the means of seeing God's glory, through the means of revealing himself, and that ongoing transformation is from the inside out. The new covenant promises us that that transformation happens from the inside to the outside. And we see those echoes in the Old Testament. We see those echoes in other passages that remind us that it is the heart, right? In, in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, it talks about writing the, the word of God, knowing the law, not just in your mind, but writing it and inscribing it on things putting it on your forehead. From the inside out, the word begins to transform us and change us so that the inward heart leads into our behaviors on the outside, how we live, how we work. The internal leads to external practices or behavior, and this work is ongoing. He does it. Let me repeat, we do not. And why is this good news? It's great news because it totally takes from us the pressure to perform. You could just, it's not my job. It's my job to be faithful. It's my job to do my studies. It's my job to do the work that God has entrusted me to do, but I am not the spirit. There's no pressure for me to perform, to be perfect. There's no stressing yourself out trying to transform yourself and others. You know what I'm talking about? If any of you have been in ministry for like a minute, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, gosh, if I could just change that person, if I could just... just oh, oh. I've told them a thousand times. They sit in the chair every Sunday. They keep going down that road if I could just change them. But it's the spirit that does that work. And it is an ongoing thing. We're not done yet. So in community, by the Spirit, in light of his glory, this ongoing transformation happens. Lastly, the passage says that with unveiled faces, we contemplate the Lord's glory. And I want to spend some time here. With unveiled faces, we contemplate the Lord's glory. God's glory is seen in the face of Christ. God's glory is seen in the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. Our gaze must be in the fullness of Christ and in the fullness of the gospel. Because when we see his glory, it motivates us. When we see his glory, we're reminded that last song we just sang, I, mean, I got lost for a minute. I had to remember, I had to pull myself back together and come up here. God's glory is captivating. It reminds us that everything's going to be all right. It reminds us that there's more than just now and today and my problems and my issues. It reminds us of who God is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. That's why we must have gospel-shaped worship that recognizes God's glory God's work, God's character. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 echoes 2 Corinthians, asking us to offer ourselves to be transformed. Let me read that again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're asked to offer ourselves to the work of the Spirit in transforming and to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's why... Worship is so important. That's why congregational worship is so important. That's why acts of adoration and listening and singing and talking and shouting to God about who he is is important. Worship in community by the Spirit forms us in Christ 
so that we may grow in his likeness. It keeps us focused on the glory of God. The practice of worship gives us a space where we can agree in song together as a community. So when the worship leader sings, do you agree that he is holy? You would all sing back, yes, we all agree. Do you agree that he is faithful? Yes, we all agree. Do you agree that there's no other name above the name of Jesus? Yes, we all agree. That's why we worship together. So we can stand before a glorious, awesome, magnificent, powerful, just, and loving God and agree. Agree that he's worthy to be worshipped. Agree that he's worthy to be praised. Agree that he's worthy to be followed. Agree that our obedience is worth something because of who God is. Formational worship must portray God in all of his glory. It's his glory that draws us to him. He must be exalted. He must be proclaimed. And he must be experienced as truly glorious. That's why we must work hard in worship. Because we're distracted people. And our eyes wander, right? Our congregation, their eyes wander. They're not always focused on the glory of God. The kids in my youth group, their eyes, they wander. They are not focused on the glory of God. It's kind of like my six-month-old son. Okay, you put this in front of him with lights, and there's buttons, and there's songs, and all of a sudden it's like, Justo, Justo. Who's the, come, who's the, who's the, no, he's like focused on this, and such as we are in our worship of God. It's like a toy put before a six-month-old son. The lights, the songs, the shininess of the toy, and all of a sudden we forget God's glory. All of a sudden we're not interested anymore in God's glory. It's like me at Target. Have any of you ever walked into the part of Target that has the dollar spot? You know which one I'm talking about? So many shiny things for a dollar. And my husband has to be like, Sandra, look, just focus. That's what he tells me. Focus, Sandra. We're here. Soap, shampoo, toothpaste, yogurt. That's what we said. Soap, shampoo, toothpaste, yogurt. Focus. Worship in community by the Spirit forms us in Christ so that we grow in his likeness. That's why it's in community. Because we need someone to help us focus. Our eyes wander. We are distracted. That's why congregational worship is critical. It's not about singing songs. It's theology to music. It's sermon to song. Old Testament theologian Danny Carroll, I was having a conversation with him about worship, and he said this, along with the preacher, the worship leader has the most profound role in shaping the theology of a congregation. Did you hear that? The worship leader, along with the preacher, has the most profound role in shaping the theology of the congregation. When we as a church at Grace and Peace, when we gather, we're gathering after we've had our Monday through Saturday our context of fighting X, Y, and Z. And we come together and we sing, you are good all the time and all the time you are good. And that anthem from the experience of the black church reminds us and shapes our theology. It reminds our congregants that God is good in the heart. When my mom is deported and I'm bouncing from house to house and I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow, God is good all the time. God is good in our infertility. When we want something but we just can't seem to have it, God is good. When our son is born with special needs that take a lifetime of energy and giving up of an investment and a dream of being a teacher, God is still good. God is good when cancer claims my life. God is good when an unjust prison sentence claims my husband. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. So good. So good. Yeah. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. So good. The worship in our churches and in our spaces shape the theology of the people that we love and lead. 
It reminds them of God's glory. So how do we practice habits which strengthen our capacity for profound and honest relationship with God and with one another? How do we do this? I wish I had a lot of time to give you a ton of examples, but I'm just going to give you a couple. I have had the opportunity to work with students, college students, all over the Chicagoland area mostly. Sometimes I still fly, but mostly I stay close. And helping them understand God's heart for the world, God's heart for mission, God's heart for the places they're going to this summer. So I do a lot of training for summer missions. And one of the things I always do with them is, an, uh, is a session of worship and lament. So it's a time where we have prayer and music and silence and reflection and readings. Where we stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in our country, in our neighborhoods, and around the world and what they're going through. And every time I start one of those sessions, it's like deer in the headlights. Like, what are we doing? Because it's a new practice for them. They may not even have heard the things I'm putting on the, on the screen. Do they know what's happening with Egyptian refugees? Do they know what's happening with Syrian refugees? Do they know what's happening in Ferguson? Do they know what's happening in New York City? Do they even know what's happening in Humble Park? Just down the street from them. No, they often don't know. And so to invite them to stand in solidarity with brothers and sisters when they have absolutely no idea what's happening, of course they're going to stare at me like, I don't get it. What are we doing? This is lame. Why can't we just sing songs? But how can I send them to the world to do mission if they can't stand in solidarity with their brothers and sisters in their experiences? And by the end of our time together, I can see how God is forming them, even in just that one hour. Even if all they walk away with is, I have never suffered that way. And then when they go to Guatemala or they go to Egypt or they go to Chicago and they hear their brothers and sisters singing, you are good all the time, all the time, you are good. They're like, how can they be singing this? In their poverty, in their pain, in their persecution, in their suffering. How, how, oh God, could they be singing this? And where are you? They've had the experience of lamenting, of standing in solidarity with, and then that congregation maybe helps them enter into hope. And they're being formed. What if I just gave them what they wanted? What if I just took them where they wanted to go and not where they needed to go? Right? I have another one for my community. I always tell people that it doesn't matter if you're it doesn't matter if you're Baptist, Presbyterian, free, reformed. If you're Latino, you're partially Pentecostal. Okay, it's like everybody's a Pentecostal, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Ed Free, Pentecostal, Catholic, Pentecostal. They're all Pentecostal. So I belong to a Christian Reformed church. All right, like of the Dutch background Christian Reformed church. But I always tell people, my church is a Puerto Rican, black, Pentecostal, Christian Reformed church in the urban setting. And they go, what? Exactly. So there is not really the practices or spiritual disciplines that I would find, like, at the Calvin Symposium at my church. So when I first got there, I was like, I really want to do the table. Like, I learned so much in my worship classes. I really want to, like, highlight the importance of the table. And they were like, oh, no, 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 we don't do that here. Like once a quarter, maybe. Or, or whenever we feel led to do it, right? And I was like, no, 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 we have to get it in the calendar. What calendar? In the calendar, in the structure. <laughs> because I want to celebrate the life, the suffering, the death, the presence, and the coming of Christ. And so they said, cool, let's do it. So we've been doing it in all different ways, in all different forms, and I see the congregation forming, being changed around that act of worship, around that practice of worship. Now we're in Lent. My small group never heard the word before, Lent. 
it's like out there where you don't eat, where you just eat fish, right? So we're practicing Lent together. We're actually using a book that takes us through the church year, like through the calendar year. And the small group is loving it because we just came through Epiphany, which was about the glory and the revelation of God. And now we're going down into reflection, repentance, humility, self-sacrifice, and they love it. But it's a new practice and it's forming them. So when I meet with my worship leader and he says, I want to sing these three songs. I'm like, you can't sing those three songs. It's Lent. we got to sing these kinds of songs. What do you mean? I said, Let, come with me to Calvin and I'll teach you. Right. Learning new practices, new things to be formed. We need one another. Those college students need those who are on the margins to teach them about who God is and what it means to follow him. And the folks in my church need people to remind them that we belong to something that's greater and bigger and has traditions that we've been following for thousands of years that aren't just white. They're church traditions coming from places like the Middle East and Africa. We need one another in this formation of worship. Worship gets people right up close to the glory and magnificence and the grace and the mercy of God, and it changes us. Worship in community by the Spirit forms us in Christ so we can grow into his likeness. It changes us. That time at the table, it changes us. Those prayers of lament, they change us. When we come to chapel together and we lift our arms up and we sing about God's glory, it changes us. All those things change us. And if that's so, if this is true, why is it that many ministries I've worked with invest in preachers and developing preachers but not worship leaders? Why is it that some churches will let anyone with a guitar and half a voice come up and lead worship, but they would never do that with a pulpit? Why is it that so much is invested in teaching and shaping preachers but so little in forming worshiping communities? If worship is a means of grace and spiritual formation that God has given us, shouldn't we be extra careful in this area, in both the selection and training of our worship pastors? If we want to disciple people in truth, we will pick our worship leaders very carefully. This has implications for us as individuals. It has implications for our congregations. It has implications for what we do here in this space. When I went to InterVarsity at first to go and work on campus, I swear I would be like, who can lead worship? Oh, this guy plays guitar. I'm like, I didn't ask who could play guitar. I asked who could lead worship. Oh, that girl sings. I didn't ask who could sing. I asked who could lead worship. Because in that space, we profoundly shape the people that we're leading. Worship and community by the Spirit forms us in Christ so that we may grow into his likeness. So let me end with these three questions and prayer. Do you and do we consider what we are forming in people through the preaching, the prayer, and our songs? Do we invite and acknowledge and depend on the Spirit in our doing so? And are we encouraged that the transformation he wants for our congregation is also what he wants for us? Let's pray.